I don't know about you, but if you've ever been asked, what superpower would you most like to have if you could have any, you've probably got an answer already chambered up. But if we look at superpowers from a perspective of how they shape us in general, we all actually have some already. It may not be invisibility, highly unlikely it's the ability to fly. Uh, but there are some things that you do better than anybody else. And we want to make sure that you're enjoying those superpowers, exercising them. And if you've lost them, I want you to get them back. So it's a new book called The Five Lost Superpowers, Why We Lose Them, How to Get Them Back. And we are joined by two of the authors, Andrew Reed and Lene Steinhagen, uh, covering us, joining us from Minnesota, Pennsylvania. I'm in Michigan. So this is a Rust Belt special. Lene and Andrew, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Bill? I'm doing great. Hi, Lene. Hi. Really, really great to be here. Thanks, Bill, for having us. Uh, you and I were talking off air about some of your future vacation plans to Michigan's beautiful Upper Peninsula. So we're going to hold you to that and make sure you, you make your way up there. <laughs> I will uh, let you know when I'm on my way. Yeah, Lene, let me, uh, let me fire the first question at you because uh, this is a collaborative effort, this book, The Five Indeed. Lost Superpowers. What led to the collaboration? Why do it? Why was it important? Well, the leader of the J.M. Reed group is uh, John Reed, Andrew's father. And we uh, have been working together for a little bit more than 10 years. John, in a learning and development capacity, stumbled on the power of superpowers, helping leaders cultivate that humanness in them to make them uh, more effective leaders. And specifically, he started with the concept of curiosity, which is the first chapter in the book. And the value of being a more curious human makes for a more effective leader, a more effective team, uh, team member. And uh, that was great content. And we had a good time facilitating that. It, it cultivated some really great conversation. And then uh, we just continue to explore the five lost superpowers idea, actually specifically at the beginning of the pandemic. If there's one good thing you can say that came out of the pandemic for us, it was time. And we decided that we wanted to dig a little deeper in this and um, Andrew can, uh, can uh, build on this, but we sort of discussed as a team, what were those superpowers that we wanted to dig into beyond curiosity? And that's how we came up with the five that are in the book. Yeah. And, and Andrew, you know, I think about how the pandemic has reshaped us all in so many different ways. I think leadership is one of those ways. We went from, hey, the boss wants to see you in the office to, hey, at three o'clock, we got a Zoom meeting for everybody in the, on the team. Right. And you're still wearing sweats from the waist down and you're, you know, you throw on a golf shirt from the waist up and leadership became less about uh, physical presence and maybe even some degree of intimidation. I think it cast a light on the ability to effectively motivate and communicate. Am I, am I on the right track here? Have you seen a metamorphosis to what leadership looks like? I think so. And I think you also have a lot of people who were injected back into their home and having to balance new priorities as well. Right. I mean, I know for, for myself, it was now I'm home all the time. I've got three kids and I'm not traveling anymore. And for the beginning of the pandemic, they were home from school all the time. So managing all of the household duties along with the work duties became a balance that ever, that many people had to deal with on top of managing these, uh, hybrid teams, or for those who weren't able, you know, the essential workers who weren't able to stay home, really high stress and uh, high intensity situations. And I think that being a manager with this resilience, with this curiosity about what people are going through and all, and with compassion uh, for what everyone's unique circumstances, that, that those were really, that those needs were really highlighted in that time. Well, I love that we started with curiosity, because with this additional downtime on our hands, you know, you start seeing things like uh, you can't find a puzzle in a store anymore. Uh, you, you, you're, you're, you're looking at uh, book sales going through the roof. I really hope, Lene, that people have started to explore the things that they've always wondered about. Um, but your book title says why we lose our superpowers. So let's go back there. Where do they go? What happens? What happens life, to those things? Life that happens. We, yeah. Life happens. Uh, you know, these are 
innate to who we are. We are, you know, we are born with natural curiosity. And this is one of the things that John has loved to explore. The idea that school, social norms, culture, uh, all sort of tells us how we should show up. And that starts as early as, you know, elementary school. And Andrew, Andrew is an elementary school teacher in his, in his past life. He still has a lot of those terrific skills and, and can speak to this a little bit. You know, the challenge of, of uh, having a classroom of 30, 35 children is, you know, you want to make sure that they learn and you want to cultivate, uh, a, a, you know, an appreciation for new things. And you also need to manage that herd of, you know, little humans. And so one thing that sort of uh, takes the curiosity out of us as children is the need to conform and fit, you know, and fit into the time frame that school or other circumstances require. The same can be said for the other superpowers, for uh, authenticity, uh, compassion, playfulness, for sure. I wrote the chapter on resilience, uh, and resilience is a, a little bit more of a continuum thing. But generally speaking, what happens, Bill, is life happens. And we get all of these messages uh, from early in our lives mm. about how we should show up. And often that takes us away from what our natural approach to things is. And, and what's, Andrew, the, what's the downside of losing track of your superpowers, of, of um, loosing your grip on the things that make you, you? Ultimately, we just become less effective, uh, not only as leaders, not only as uh, coworkers, but as people. I mean, the, the moment I stop enjoying being playful around what I'm doing in my life, you know, that that takes away from my quality of life. The second I stop being curious about what's going on for you, I lose my ability to see things in, in a new way or broaden my perspective. Uh, so I think that each of the superpowers, once we lose them, it really takes away from us either in that, you know, intellectual and work product way or also just in a quality of life way. Quality of life is a, a fascinating concept to explore in the context of, of your book, The Five Law Superpowers, because we have to mix into the cauldron. We have to mix in what's happened the last year and a half and mm -hmm. in, some, in some ways is, is still continuing. So quality of life, and to me, I, I grab onto that superpower you, you mentioned earlier, authenticity. Um, we have redefined what authentic means. Take a combination of pandemic life, the surge of bizarreness in the world of social media, um, everybody becoming a keyboard hero, everybody having their own camera to mm -hmm. post whatever they feel like. And I don't know where we are with authenticity as a culture these days, let alone as individuals. Um, it, it feels like we're, well, I'll, 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 I'll quote my pastor. He said uh, a couple months ago in a sermon, he said, we are easily the most technologically advanced and connected society in the history of the world. And yet we are by far the most isolated and alone. Mm -hmm. Where are we, Lene, in the, in the category of authenticity? In the category of authenticity. I, I mean, I think there's something to be said for the message from your pastor in terms of our feeling of disconnectedness. Certainly that is elevated by all of us communicating now via Zoom and via computer. Uh, last year, the world really changed for us as learning and development professionals. We had for years been in the classroom, you know, elbow to elbow with our clients, with uh, th those people that we were working with and learning with. And now all of that happens, you know, through this computer. And so it does make us feel a little bit more disconnected. I think in term, to answer your question specifically about where are we with authenticity, I think it, it, in some ways it becomes even harder to be who we are in, a, in that social media virtual world because we want to be perceived one way. Mm -hmm. And again, the rules of how we should behave, that should, I keep coming up with that word because I think that that's something that's so significant for us, both uh, in, in our communities, but also in the workplace is sort of the shoulds, how you, know, how you should show up. There's some grace, I think though, that has been extended to us 
as human beings. So there's a little bit of a both and in this virtual world. And Andrew spoke to it a little bit, working at home with kids. And so there's been some grace associated with, you know, we're on Zoom, we're in our homes. You know, sometimes a cat walks across the computer <laughs> or a kid marches in while you've got to meet. And that is, that, that is real. That's our real life. And we've been able to laugh a little bit with that. Um, and there, you know, there may be some judgment associated with it. Um, but I think what it's done in some ways is level the playing field. Um, the key, I think, for any of these superpowers is not only practicing them, but connecting action with feeling so that we can sustain a sense of ourselves. You know, fake it until you make it, it was uh, was something that a lot of people did for a really long time, but that's not sustainable. And that feeling with the action is also something that we talk about in each of the chapters, making sure that there is, you know, that there are actions that you can take to sort of re reconnect with your superpowers, but also to uh, sustain that. And how do you connect that feeling? Yeah, and if I could go along with what Lene said, she talked about judgment. And I, I saw something interesting the other day, o the Oprah magazine or O magazine, whatever it was, had, had posted something about, um, you know, introverts, how to be more social was like mm. the title of their article. And, you know, uh, someone else had commented below that, you know, how can we never see articles that say extroverts, how to be quiet and contemplative, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's right. a good point. So we, we, we also put value on the way different people are. And so many of us get messages along the way that, well, the way you are isn't the best way to be. Mm -hmm. And being authentic is more about accepting who you are because what ends up happening, I mean, the cycle that so you're sort of talking about, Bill, is, I get messages all the time that I'm not I'm not the right way. And then I lash out online, I become a keyboard hero, but really it's not because I find it's not typical. People become angry and then find something to be angry about, right? They become excluded or, or isolated and then they find something that, to channel that into where we can all take a step back and saying, well, how are we valuing how people show up? What, what are their internal qualities? I can tell you from teaching in elementary schools, that um, there is a, and it's sort of somewhat shifting, but especially when I started, there's a very rigid uh, archetype for what they want students to act like. Mm -hmm. You go into many schools and it's sit in the chair, you know, we wear uniforms, we don't, you know, and kids about the uniforms uh, find the littlest things to just uh, share their, their individuality, right? We, we had uniforms, the only thing that wasn't in the uniform code was the socks. You, every single kid, had the flashy socks <laughs> it was like the thing right that you just find the way to, to express your individuality but i bring that up because kids are supposed to sit in chairs right i never made my kids do that you you know they're the purpose of sitting in a chair really is to get the kids to be where they belong and not mm -hmm. disrupt their neighbors so that's what i told them i said you know you can stand you can move around whatever as long as you're not bothering somebody else you're fine no problems in the classroom with discipline because they're getting what they need out they're getting the movement out uh but they understand the you know the the thing i don't want them to do and they're and they feel the trust that they will they, they won't do that i'm reminded of a story my wife shared years ago she was substitute teaching for uh, my mom's kindergarten class my mom taught kindergarten for 33 years my wife happened to be a sub way back when before we had kids and uh, the, the kids were going to do some reading and she said to them, we're going to take turn, we're going to, uh, to read taking turns going around the table. And she kind of turned her back for a moment. And when she looked up, the first kid was walking around the table while reading very oh, literal, you know, just yeah. taking this instruction yes. to it. And every, we have this, um, especially when it comes to dealing with younger kids, we're trying to force them into a template that does not fit every one size does not fit all right the way that we educate the way that we socialize the way that we interact is not spandex we can't all get in it it doesn't all work and if if we try it it's not going to look very good um and yet here we are now in this social media culture where the desire to be liked to have uh, thumbs ups and retweets and all the different things I believe has led us as a people to be less authentic 
than maybe any other time because we're putting forth the things that we hope other people approve of. Mm -hmm. that, that's not always the authentic side. Um, do you think, Lene, this is sort of connected to our general discussion, overall, if we could turn back time until, well, I don't know, 2009 or whenever it all started, are we better off with social media or would we have been better off without it? Oh, Bill, you're asking me such I a I ask this question, question quite frequently and I, I love to get, a, I get a variety of answers. Mm -hmm. are, we, are we better off? I think that what I personally love about social media, even the internet in general, is how it can open up worlds, how it can open us up to different perspectives, uh, to, to more information. Uh, I, I love that about it. Different perspectives, different lifestyles, uh, different people that, that we're given an opportunity to see things that we've never seen before. I love that. And I think that that is the, you know, that is a strength that of social media, of the internet that I would never want to take away. Um, and so I think in general, we are better off because of all of the opportunities that each of us has that we didn't have before. I say each of us though, not everybody has equal access to all of this information and not everybody has the ability to parse or process right. all of the information right. that's available. And so I think that actually is what makes social media and the in internet really challenging is our own individual ability or community ability to process what is coming at us. Um, there are also rules that are set for us and it's those rules I think that, that confuse us about how to be authentic, how we should show up. I don't know, Andrew, how would you build on that? Or what are your thoughts about that giant question? Thanks for that, Bill. That's a huge I question. think it's difficult and I think it varies by culture and society, but I think ultimately uh, what I would, I think the ills of social media fall more on the way that social media has been monetized and put out by the specific companies rather than the concept in general. That's a good And point. I think that you know, if I think about it from a government standpoint, right, I don't think that there was a, there was a lot of strategic vision and sort of what can this turn into and how can we regulate it to make sure that it doesn't morph into something? Because if you, if you read the thing, stuff and it's all about, like you said, people are looking for likes, but sometimes they're also, they're just looking for any emotional reaction. Yeah. Right. Just, can I get you to, to react to this viscerally rather than intellectually? Such a good point. And I can't imagine the laugh that uh, Jack Dorsey or Zuckerberg have in their office after they've just been through a grilling in front of a congressional panel populated with 83 year olds using flip phones, asking them <laughs> questions about technology and trying to fix the whole thing. There are some things and I think this is a perfect connection into your your driving message here with the five law superpowers. There are so many things that we keep waiting for somebody else to repair, somebody else to fix. We, we keep waiting for government to control how this works and that works and how people interact. And you said these words, so you're out of a job now and this kind of thing. And all of these different things that are flying around us, sometimes through social media, sometimes just through the news that can really drag you down. And I'm a firm believer that, that if we would just pull out the mirror, and look in the mirror and say, how can, how can I, how can I be a better neighbor, dad, you know, son, husband, what, how can I do these things? That's where the, the fix comes. And that's where we begin to regain uh, our five superpowers. That's where we, we start to once again, become curious, because if I'm willing to ask myself, what are my, what are my flaws or my blind spot that that's curiosity at its best. Um, authenticity, so, compassion, playfulness, and resilience helps you bounce back from an awful lot of hurt that may have occurred at some point in your life. I'm not, I'm not trying to speak to your book better than the co-authors, but that's what goes through my mind, Lene. So Bill, one of the things that I write about in the resilience chapter, which is a significant part of resilience research, research 
is getting really clear on your locus of control. And children who demonstrate resilience, th there is a connection with their ability to identify their locus of control. And that is feeling like they are architects of their own experience or even of their own future. And I think locus of control is also something that's really important for all of us to consider. So going back to the comments that you just made, I believe there's a yes and here. And that is yes, we all have a uh, responsibility for our own behavior and we're part of a collective. And so I think what we get to do as effective humans, as good humans, as leaders, as good leaders is to ask what is within my control, what is within my locus of control to improve my own behavior, my own response to something in a way that will allow me to be who I am as an, you know, as a human being, as an authentic, compassionate human being and contribute to the collective because my actions do affect uh, you know, others. And so this is something that's really critical for us at the JM Reed Group is to think about how can you be more effective as an individual contributor and also in leading others or as a team member. Um, so there is that yes and with the, uh, yeah, your individual actions respond, you know, uh, matter. And they matter because you are part of a collective. You're part of a community. You're part of a social system, uh, and those are those are important. Those are important to uh, our society. Of, of the superpowers that that are listed, I have to think that this time in in our history will test resiliency, perhaps as the number one item on that list, for all the reasons that we're all aware of in the pandemic world with so much. Mm -hmm. So much loss and so much disruption, whether you're mm -hmm. six years old or 76, you do not escape what's happening in this world. Uh, Andrew, how does, how does the resiliency part of this fit together? Um, how does it fit together? Well, I mean, I think that we all have to realize that we have, uh, we have value. We bring value to the world and we have to love ourselves. <laughs> I think that's part number one, right? Lene is, is just like you, you have to love yourself. You have to, you know, you, you, and then we, you realize that there is something that we can get out of it. You can make, I mean, I think meaningful connections, right? Lene, it's gotta be one of the keys. What else would you say? Around you know, it's funny that you should say love, that you should bring that up. I was actually thinking about that this morning and thinking that, uh, I, uh, I want to explore more about the connection between resilience and love and different kinds of love, self-love, familial love, romantic love, et cetera. Um, but I think that that is really important. I think there's a thread actually between resilience and all of the superpowers. So a greater sense of curiosity, of authenticity, the ability to be compassionate, which really helps you connect to others. So Andrew just mentioned that, having a sense of connection and then also playfulness. I think if you can tap into those superpowers, those actually help contribute to a more resilient self. You know, we don't, again, we don't do any of this living on our own. We do it in community. We do it with our families, with our church groups, with our spiritual communities, however you define those. We do those with our golf clubs, with our golf buddies. Um, you know, we do it with schools. We do all of these things with each other. And so connection through compassion, even playfulness, uh, you know, I, I, that's that's a superpower that we end up not talking a whole lot about because I, I and I think that's one of the reasons we felt really strongly wouldn't you agree Andrew about including it is that it's it's a superpower that's often overlooked um, maybe it's just something that's yeah it's superpower light and I wouldn't say that it's superpower light because uh, playfulness is a way for us to connect and that ultimately helps with um, greater resilience I think yeah definitely underappreciated mm -hmm. <laughs> I love the idea of compassion being a superpower. Um, I do a lot of work in the nonprofit sector as a consultant and helping tell the stories of those, those wonderful charitable causes that are changing lives. And uh, in, in, in the case of the clients that I work with, none of them are federally tax dollar supported. They all are reliant on the generosity of individuals. 
Well, that's compassion. Compassion, giving to something that you, you know is making a, a world of difference. Uh, I would like to think, as we talk about this context of the pandemic era, I think compassion has made a comeback, is making a comeback. It doesn't get the headlines because the old mantra, if it bleeds, it leads, is still in effect. But compassion matters. And I have seen, whether it's a natural disaster that hits an area, or whether it's the, the homeless shelter in the town near you uh, that has a campaign to open up a new women and children's shelter, whatever it is, I have seen people at a time when it would be perfectly understandable to hunker down, hoard your money because you never know what's happening next. I've seen people uh, act out of great generosity and compassion. Are you seeing that as well as you, as you talk more and more about the five law superpowers? How are we doing, Andrew, in the compassion meter if there is such a word? If not, I just made one up. I think it's interesting because I think that you're right that when there's an event, when people can see the um, the suffering of others and that suffering is is really overt and obvious, people open up, they're willing to do something and go out. It is more of the everyday compassion that is lacking. So I think that there are people that are suffering on a daily basis and their suffering doesn't cross a certain threshold of, of um, I don't know, I, I don't know how you would say it, but just it, there's a threshold that we kind of accept mm -hmm. and it's a shame. And I can tell you for, again, going back to my, uh, my working in the schools, I mean, there are kids that are growing up in conditions, going to school buildings that are toxic for them. The, the, mm -hmm. the building, I worked in a school building where for the first three months of school, we couldn't drink the water. Uh, a year after I left the school, they shut down the cafeteria because they realized that the level of uh, chemicals or, or, toxins in the in that part of the school building was too high right now it was high when i was there um but they didn't do enough testing to figure out that it was oh, oh actually it was way too high you know we have um there's tons of situations around this idea of we we accept a certain level of suffering for people rather than doing the everyday things we could to, to improve their mm -hmm. lives or we're just saying Hey, this isn't right. Kids can't go to schools like this. Mm -hmm. they, they can't, uh, you know, this can't happen over here. And we've got to do something about it. And I think that that, if we were to take those actions, we might actually reduce the times where people need that big, heavy influence. Mm -hmm. It's a very good point. And, and, and by the way, your example of water in the schools is especially poignant for me. I live 35 minutes from Flint, Michigan. Okay. Sure. And yes. no, no greater scandalous disgrace has unfolded in America, maybe in my lifetime, except it's now happening in other communities. And they're starting to say, we don't want to be like that. Yeah. In reality, you, <laughs> you're, you already are, but you're just discovering it. So, and they still uh, don't have clean water in Flint. No, and it's quite, it's quite bizarre because an awful lot of money has come in to provide that clean water, and yet they're still drinking out of bottles. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, compassion is such a powerful, powerful concept in so many different levels. Uh, Lene, let me kind of go back big picture again, if I could, for the book, uh, The Five Lost Superpowers, why we lose them and how to get them back. Why does it matter? I think Andrew talked uh, about it and said it really succinctly at the beginning of our conversation, and that is that it makes us more effective. I think the connection that I would make with what Andrew said and something that I said earlier about doing these things and feeling these things. So making the connection between uh, being compassionate, acting out of compassion and feeling compassionate, uh, being authentic, showing up as yourself and feeling confident. Uh, that's how we sustain these things. One of the things that I write a little bit about and have learned a lot about in the resilience research is the idea that even in this, even in society, social media, uh, lots of areas, it, there's there's something about showing up as being really strong that, that we value when somebody shows up and they're strong, you know, oh, she's so strong. Oh, and look what she can handle. And, you know, all of those axioms, you never know how strong you're you need to be until that's your only choice, blah, blah, blah. And I say blah, 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 because sometimes you can look at somebody and they seem strong, but they don't feel strong. And it's that feeling, it's the connection between the idea of these superpowers 
with not just the idea, but how do I connect the action and the heart, the doing and the feeling, because we want these to be sustainable. That I think is one of the things that's so important. None of this, none of these superpowers are, uh, are an inch deep, shallow. I mean, all of them go really, really deep. And in order to keep them alive for you, you have to figure out ways to connect to your heart because I think that does make us more effective. It makes us uh, able to handle the challenges every day and to do what Andrew just suggested. And that's, you know, not wait for some mammoth issue, some issue that, you know, requires a huge response, but just every day to step into circumstances differently because we know it'll make a difference. And it'll it'll make a difference, not just to us, but to our community. Because as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are a collective. What we do matters to those around us. Yeah, just just a couple days ago, we uh, we laid to rest a hero of mine, a gentleman who I've known since I was a little boy, and he was described uh, by another uh, person eulogizing him as a patriarch. And he said, a little boy grows up to become a man, and that's wonderful. But when a man becomes a patriarch, a leader of others who activates leadership in others and spurs them on to live a full life, that that's the legacy that you leave behind. And I, 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 I know that one of the goals that you all have in this book is to help equip leaders to activate superpowers in themselves and in other people around them. That's what mm-hmm. makes the entire team better. It's not just if the leader is the, the incredible you know, general, or, but if his troops, if his followers, if his staff isn't any good, then he's not a very good leader. You know, Bill, when you were talking earlier about social media and how, you know, what it cultivates in us is that desire to get an emotional response. And Andrew added to that, uh, you know, we, we like to, as human beings, we, we are, you know, we are emotional beings that think, not the other way around. So the emotions come first, the thinking comes next. We like to have our heart touched as humans. We like to have a feeling, I mean, all of us can relate to that feeling of uh, our heart swelling because we feel good about ourselves or we feel good watching someone else succeed. And so when we've got leaders that show us what it's like to be human, it gives us permission to be human, to be more compassionate, to admit our mistakes, to ask for help, Uh, And those are the things that make us more effective, not just as leaders, but also as human beings. Andrew, how how would you build on that idea? And I mean, I think there's plenty of examples through history. I mean, Milton Hershey is someone who's from the Pennsylvania area, who, if you've looked into him, you know, built a town around his company, the Hershey's Chocolate Company, uh, where he, it was 1903, and he had indoor plumbing and heating and all of the, the amenities of life. He wanted to make sure that his workers had those things available for them and their families. And then he built a school that took in um, not only the workers' kids, but also uh, orphans, children, children from from, uh, underprivileged areas. And and that legacy continues today. And so when we see it, you know it exists. You know there's people out there that that do these wonderful things. And uh, Bill, going back to your point about about, um, the man that you've recently lost, I mean, it it is inspiring to us. And we can all be that person. Mm -hmm. We can also put that good out into the world and help people find themselves and help and help them understand uh, that they are good as they are. And let's, let's just, you know, dial that up a little bit so that you can, can share that with others. And we create that sense of community for everybody. Um, We're really people- lucky because of the leadership of our company, Andrew, this is Andrew's father. So of course, Andrew's relationship with, with John is, is much different than all, uh, than all the rest of us for obvious reasons. Um, but he is a, a great leader and shows us how to be human. Um, John is a, it will be the first to tell the story and Andrew, you have to make sure that I get it straight. He's a four time cancer survivor. Is it four time, yeah. five to four time cancer survivor. And you know what that did for John, I think is really just change 
just change his perspective about what matters. No one is more authentic to, to me than John. John shows up as, you know, as himself with all of his curiosity, uh, with, it, with a willingness to check his ego at the door, although he's got a really big ego. And yet he, you know, and yet he's also very willing to stop and be challenged and rethink and change his position. Uh, no one is more playful than John. Uh, you know, he is the first one to tell a joke, to laugh at a joke, to laugh at himself. Uh, and so he, speaking of role models and someone who shows us the way, you know, we're really lucky that we've been working with somebody who shows us the way. And that's very inspiring. It's very inspiring to be around people who are fully, fully comfortable in their skin. Mm -hmm. And that I think is one of the things that we're inviting people to do with this book is to go back to who you are innately, get reconnected with those uh, characteristics, then this is your nature. It's your nature to be resilient, to be authentic, to be curious. Uh, so getting back in touch with that makes you not just effective, uh, it, you know, it makes people want to be around you because you're, because you're true. And all of it, we all know as human beings, we know true. Boy, do we know true. We may, you know, we may easily get sucked into something that shows up as shiny and exciting, um, but we, we won't stay around if we discover that it's not true. Yeah, very well and said. Hold on what Lene said, I think, you know, my dad went through cancer four times. Um, and in thinking about it in, in a little bit more broadly, there was a CEO from Pepsi, her name was Indra Noy. Mm -hmm. And she once gave a speech where she talked about um, how when she would go home, her she would talk want to tell her mom something great that happened to her. And her mom was like, well, first, you got to do these chores for me. First, you got to do that. Like your mom was always get she was this, you know, she's a <laughs> massively impressive CEO, a female CEO at the time, you know, but we when very few were at companies at that level. And when she would go home, her mom would still order her around like she was her child, which she was. And she said, you know, my mom was my toe holder. And I think that's a very interesting concept for us that we that I want to embrace and I want people to embrace is that no matter how far how successful you get, no matter how good you're doing, someone's got to be there to ground you and say, hey, wait, you know, life's hard. Life's hard for everybody. Life's hard for you. And I think that that's what it did my dad is he, you know, really has built this amazing company and, and his uh touched so many people's lives, but he's always grounded. He always, mm. there's something holding him down and saying, no, that, you know, stay in the real world, stay here with us. That's Sometimes it's, it's kind of appealing to escape the real world, but I certainly appreciate the point that you made about your dad. Uh, the book is called The Five Lost Superpowers. Now I have to tell you that uh, for those of you who are listening to just the audio version, we're glad to have you. Some of you are watching us uh, on the video version and I fully expected Andrew and Lene to be maybe wearing capes or masks or something. <laughs> oh, we you know, have masks. I'm we sure. should have worn masks them. <laughs> oh, now, yeah, now you're talking. I mean, it's right around Halloween as we're, as we're recording this. So I have to ask you a question off the list. We have curiosity, resilience, authenticity, compassion, and playfulness. And as we wind down our time, we're going to go into playfulness for a minute. I want to know what one superpower off the traditional list you, you wish you had. Not off the book list, but like, I'll go first. The superpower that I, I, I most wish I had is the ability to look at and point at any vehicle on the road and dis <laughs> disable it for one hour. All right. I don't want it to flip over in a fiery ball of death. I just, I'm going to disable it for one hour. That, like that guy who just is driving like a maniac. I want to just point. I want to have it slowly move over to the side of the road. And the one hour reason is because I want him to have had to call AAA and that when they get there, it's going to be about an hour. Then they go to fire up the car, works just fine. And now they just think he's insane, but it's cost him an hour. That's my, that's my desired superpower as a guy who drives far too much. So yeah, Andrew, but Bill, I don't get it. Why do you want to cost him an hour? Like, why do you want him to stop? I don't get why you want him to oh, stop. I, I want it to slow him down because he's going to kill somebody. Oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, okay. He's the, he's yeah, the guy who's, he's the guy who's weaving in and out at 110 okay. and you just need to, you just need to move him over. 
You and, want the uh, main controls for OnStar. Right. <laughs> we got to get in front of you. <laughs> I just, I, I, the place that I went was the old NPR program, uh, the car guys, click oh. and clack. Like, which one are you then, <laughs> you know, uh, or are you both of them? Because you were talking about cars. Yeah. Oh, I'm so useless when it comes to the mechanical side of vehicles, which is sad for a young man who grew up with his dad being an auto dealer. Uh, but that's a whole nother story. Andrew, what's your superpower wish? Um, you know, I've never really, I mean, I guess, I guess flight would be yeah. may, maybe my choice, but I've never been too much into the traditional superpowers. And I, uh, I find Batman's story most compelling just because he does go through this, this tragedy and, and is resilient and compassionate yeah. and comes through it wanting to save his city. He's got some good toys too. I mean, the toys are fantastic. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. And I prefer the old uh, Adam West version where <laughs> the camera tricks made it look like they were climbing up the oh. side of the building and celebrities would pop their heads out of windows as they were going. So I, I, by the way, I tried climbing up my garage as a young boy. It did not work well. It didn't work well. Uh, Lene, what's your superpower? Oh, it's definitely mind control, Bill. Ah. Definitely <laughs> mind control. I have a lot of really great ideas. Just ask me and I'll tell you. And nice. I just want others to have my really great ideas and think <laughs> that mind ideas. The are Jedi the mind trick is what no, you're totally, after. absolutely. Yeah. I love nice. that. Yes. I love it. Well, thank you so much for bringing us inside the, the thoughts behind the five law superpowers, why we lose them and how to get them back. We will have uh, the links in all of the notes for all of you taking a part in this, whether it's podcast or video form. And uh, we, we wish you all the very best as this team effort. I have a feeling this isn't the last book you'll all come together to write. It's really I well done. So. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bill, for having us. It was a yeah, lot of thank fun. you, Bill.